you have your Bibles um, and you want to turn with me to John, the 11th chapter, and I'm going to read a very familiar passage of Scripture to you. Um, I'll give you a little setting on this a little later on, but in John, the, the Gospel of John, chapter 11, look at it, verse 25. Uh, Jesus said unto her, to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Then turn with me to Romans chapter 8. And I want to look at verse 11. This is actually the way the Lord spoke this to me was from this passage of Scripture, Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or make alive your mortal bodies by His Spirit who dwells in you. Now I want to establish something here. But if the Spirit of Him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you. You got that? The Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us. What Spirit dwells in us? It's real easy. The Holy Spirit, right? Okay, no trick question. And so... If the, the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us, then it will bring to life these mortal bodies. Mortal. Okay? Now, in John chapter 5 and verse 24, if you want to turn back there, we'll just go ahead and read it too. John chapter 5 and verse 24. Jesus actually makes the statement. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He who hears me, or hears my word, and believes in him who sent me, has everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. Now, are you waiting to get life, or do you have life? Are you waiting to be resurrected, or have you already been resurrected? Really, what really got me thinking in this area, Tammy and I were at a place, and a very dear friend of mine, we got ready to leave, he, uh, he caught me off guard with a statement, uh, or with a question. He said, do you know who I am? And uh, sort of took me back for a minute. <laughs> I said, well, to me, you're a very dear friend. He said, I'm the resurrection and life. And that hit me, and I have not been able to get that off of me since he said that. And I've been meditating on that statement. A lot of people initially would have a problem with that. Who does he think he is? No, it's who he knows he is. You understand? And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to talk to you about the Spirit of God who lives in you that's already raised you from the dead. Not only has God already raised us, and I'm talking about spiritual death. You with me? Not only has God already raised us from the dead, but God has given us the power and the ability to raise others from the dead. That's why we can say, I am the resurrection. I already have eternal life. Anytime that we proclaim the gospel message to the lost, you understand the sinner is in death. He needs to be resurrected. And when we proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to that person as the one who has died for his sins, 
and is resurrected for his justification. And if he'll believe that, that he can pass right that right then at that moment, he can pass from death to life. And if that person will believe that, we just resurrected the dead. Interesting, isn't it? And then there's another aspect of that. Even while Jesus was living on earth and he commissioned his 12 apostles to go out and to preach the kingdom of God, to heal the sick, cast out devils, cleanse the lepers, and what else? Raise the dead. And so we have in us resurrection power. But the church has been oblivious to what it has. Believers have been waiting to get life, not understanding that you already have what you're looking forward to. Isn't that amazing? Because the moment you're born again, you have eternal life. You won't die again. Somebody may say you died, but you know better because you'll still be living while they're talking. You understand? Because Paul says in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, for us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Dead men aren't present with the Lord. It's the living. Remember what Jesus told the Pharisees? That uh, God's not the God of the dead, but the living. He's the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. They're still living, you understand, and they'll never die. Well, the bottom line is because we accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we too will never die. We now possess eternal life, but are we aware of the life that's in us? Are we aware that the Spirit on the inside of us, and I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, is the very same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, brought Him out of the tomb? You understand do we know that? Or do we just mentally assent to that fact? To know the power that God has vested in us. I have an anticipation for the church. When I say the church, I'm talking about the body of Christ. I'm not talking about people that go by reverend and doctor and all these titles they put on themselves. I'm talking about members of the body of Christ operating in resurrected power. I believe that we're there, it's, we're here, I should say it that way I suppose, that the time is not in the future, but the time is now. This weekend I've been listening to some of the old ministers who've passed away, some of the men of renown I suppose and listen to what they say and one particular minister um, actually Lester Summerall uh, was a good friend of Smith Wigglesworth and he said you know uh, Mr. Wigglesworth was uh, in his later years of life and, and Lester Summerall said he was in his middle 20s when he first got to meet the man and he preached, and then Smith Wigglesworth preached, and he said, uh, Mr. Wigglesworth said, uh, young man, come and see me. And he said he, he did. And he said when he walked up to the porch, obviously uh, Lester Summerall was living in England at that time, and he said, I was dressed like an Englishman, the the hat, the umbrella on one arm, and a newspaper stuck under the arm, other arm, and my top coat, prim and proper, right? And he said, Mr. Rugglesworth was a very staunch man, very straight, erect, and uh, never a hair out of place. Uh, and he said, the first thing he said to me, young man, what is that under your arm? He said, well, I've that's the morning newspaper, sir. 
He said, that's not coming in my house. Only truth is allowed in my house. You're not bringing that in. Get rid of it. So he said, I threw it in the bushes. And he said, I went in and he said, I had interrupted his reading. And he said, come in, let's read the Bible. He said, he read the Bible for about 30 minutes. He said, now let's pray. He said, they prayed for about 30 minutes. He said, now let's read the Bible. He said, they read the Bible for about 30 minutes. He said, now let's pray. It was a way of life for him. But it impressed him so much, he said, I started going back about every 10 days to every two weeks and just spending time with him. A man that put the emphasis on the Word of God and the Spirit of God in prayer and a man who raised the dead. Raised his own wife three times. <laughs> you understand? A man, because of his knowledge of the Word and because of his knowledge of the Spirit of God on the inside of him, realized he had resurrection power. He realized he had eternal life on the inside of him. And he talked about the day coming when there was going to be a mighty revival in the earth. And the, covering the earth. And I was listening to another man I'd never heard of before. And he said the Spirit of God told him the very same thing. Another one was talking about the same thing. Well, I believe we're here. But it's not going to be with celebrities. You understand? I can appreciate Oral Roberts and Jack Coe and A.A. A. Allen and and uh, no, R. W. Schambach and all these these mighty men of God and even even more modern, you know, you see of Kenneth Hagin or Kenneth Copeland and guys of this uh, of this caliber that's had great impact on people's lives. But people have made them superstars and celebrities. That's not what I'm seeing. I'm seeing the everyday person that goes to work every day while he's there on the job or wherever he is. The power of God operating in that person's life because that person knows they have resurrection power. And because the person doesn't live in the flesh but lives in the spirit, then they're led by the spirit of God. They're not talking about the things of the world. They're talking about the things of God. The world doesn't consume them. You understand? And most modern day Christians, the world consumes them. It consumes their conversation. If you take the conversation of the world away from them, they won't have anything to talk about. And that's sad. That's why we're not seeing what we should be seeing is because we're not focused on where we should be focused. Instead of focusing in the realm of the spirit, we're focusing in the realm of the natural and what you put your attention on is what you're going to reproduce. You understand that what you subject yourself to influences you. If you subject yourself to the Word of God and to the Spirit of God, the Word of God and the Spirit of God will influence you to do the right thing. But if you subject yourselves to the things of the world, that's going to influence you not to go the ways of God, but to go the ways of the world. The world will tell you what you can't do. The world will tell you what you can do. The Spirit of God will lead us where we need to be. The world will take us where we shouldn't be. We're going to have to wake up. Understand the life's in you. I regularly remind myself God's in me. You know, I, I was uh, invited to speak at a place Friday, and uh, there were other speakers there, and um, and I, I was listening, you know, in the way they had someone, you know, opening up with worship and all that, and and uh, and, and I was listening to, uh, you know, what people were saying and what was going on, and and the statement kept being made, uh, you know, we want to be in the presence, we want to be in the presence, and. Um, I'm thinking, I'm already in the presence. I was in the presence of God when I walked in here. God's in me. And I couldn't contain it. <laughs> and I just, in a nice sort of way, I said, you know, 
We live in the presence of God. If God is in you, you're in his presence. You just need to get aware of it. Instead of being out here, we need to go in here where God lives. When I go in here where God lives, I know the power of God lives in me. Because I know the Holy Spirit indwells me. And if that Holy Spirit could raise Jesus from the dead, it can certainly do a master work in my life as well. Not only in me, but if I'll allow him, he can do things through me. And the same truth is for you. If the Spirit of God lives in you, then the Spirit of God can do mighty things through you, not just in you. It starts in you. You understand, He has to get us ready to where we're not bad representatives of Him. But we're excellent representatives of him and and people will will know you as a man or woman of God, not some little phrase, old man of God. I get tired of hearing that because it's abused and misused. Yes, I am a man of God, but that's not a title. I'm a man pursuing God, you understand. One in pursuit of God, yet the whole time I know that he's here. Well, what are you pursuing to know him more, to know him better, to become more aware of uh, how he operates, how he thinks, how he feels, his heart, the compassion and all these various things. And the Holy Spirit is in us to reveal these things to us if we just pay attention. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. But when I look at John chapter 5, he says, so are you. You're resurrected. You pass from death to life. The same spirit that raised me from the dead raised you from the dead. The same spirit that lives in me lives in you. I set an example of what to do with the spirit. What are you doing with it? Something to think about. But so many people, and I'm talking about church people, are waiting for rapture, are waiting for the graves to burst open and the people come out. Well, thank God that's going to happen. You understand? God can't lie. But why should I wait till then? Why not enjoy the benefit of it right now? Are you with me? People need to see resurrected life here in earth, not after it's too late. They need to see us walking in the life that God has given unto us to where they can actually draw off of that. You know, you think about Jesus in the fourth chapter of John where he's tired of his journey, uh, from a journey and he sits down by the well of uh, Jacob's well there and and you know his disciples they're going on to get food and all that and as he's sitting there at noonday a Samaritan woman comes to draw water and uh, he asks her for a drink and she wanted to make a racist situation out of it why are you a Jew talking to me a Samaritan besides that I'm a woman All he asked for was a drink of water. We don't see that she ever gave him a drink of water. As a matter of fact, she left her pitcher there. She must not even draw, drew water for herself. But he said to her, if you knew who was talking to you, you would have asked me for water. That sounds like an egotistical statement, doesn't it? But it's not an egotistical statement at all. He knew who he was. Do you know who you are? Could you make that statement? If you knew who we're talking to, you would have asked me and I could have given you something that would quench your thirst forever. Living water. You never thirst again. But she was hung up in the natural. Let me have some of that water. That way I won't have to go back to the well again. (laughs) We got to get her thinking right. And yet John chapter 7 Verse 37, the last day of the feast, Jesus says, 
cries out, anybody thirsty? Come to me. I'll give you water, everlasting water. The water that I will give you will spring up in you out of your innermost being. This water is going to flow. And then he defines what that is, the Holy Spirit. Because as of yet, the Holy Spirit, it says, had not been given. But today, the Holy Spirit's been given. The day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came, you understand. And so all we have to do is subject ourselves to the Holy Spirit. And if you don't subject yourself to the Holy Spirit, you're actually cutting yourself off from the very power of God, that Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. That's what makes you alive. Not your confession. Your confession can open the door. What you believe in your heart, your confession opens the door. But then you have to receive the Spirit of God to come into your life. And when the Spirit of God comes in, resurrection power is resident. I am the resurrection, I am the life. Because of who is in me, the resurrector is in me, the life is in me. Now we can impart into other people resurrection and life. You see that? You believe it? Now you're going to set yourself up. <laughs> Do you believe it enough to act on it? To where if someone is, uh, you know, wanting to learn something about Jesus that you don't try to send them to the minister. Do you understand the minister lives in you? The teacher lives in you? The revealer lives in you? And you start drawing off of the one inside you and you just yield your body, your mouth, your hands, whatever. You yield that to him to where he can speak through you. Then it's really not you, it's him, right? The resurrector lives in you. The life lives in you. But what are we doing with it? It's not just a house God wasn't just looking for a place to live, you understand. He's looking for a place to operate. So he'll come and live. He said the Spirit of God will live in you. Why would he want to live in me? So he can have access to me seven days a week, 24 hours a day. He's in the house. So he can manifest at his leisure. You understand? So you have resurrection power. Our authority is in the name of Jesus. But it's the Spirit of God that empowers us. You understand how God, Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with what? The Holy Spirit and power. And what was the result of that anointing? He went about doing good, healing all those oppressed of the devil because God was with him. Jesus said himself, uh, in, in Luke, uh, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because He's anointed me. He set me apart. How did He set Him apart? With the Holy Spirit and power. How does God set you apart? Same way. So if you're set apart, then you can say, The Spirit of the Lord's on me. The Spirit of the Lord's in us. Right? Now, the interesting thing about it, Jesus didn't say the Spirit of the Lord is on me to heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out devils. Did he? What did he say? He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of blind, uh, sight to the blind, and to uh, heal, uh, set at liberty those who are bruised, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is on me to do these things, is what he said, because this is what he set me apart to do. And the others were just byproducts of what he was doing, you understand? And I don't mean that belittling his ministry in any way. 
But if we'd get our focus on the Lord and get our focus on what we're supposed to do, we'd see more byproducts. The resurrection. The life. That's what's going to bring it to pass. With an understanding of who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. You understand Jesus has a role, a place, a position that no man will ever take. I'm not saying we're equal with Jesus. I'm saying that he has given us the same power and we're joint heirs with him. And through his delegation, we can do what he did. He's already redeemed mankind. We don't have to worry about that one. We couldn't do anything about that. But we can tell mankind about redemption. That Jesus has already done and bring a resurrection and a life into their being right here in this day and this time. This city needs the Lord. This state needs the Lord. This nation needs the Lord. The world needs the Lord. You understand? When he said you'll receive power after the Holy Spirit's come upon you and you'll be witnesses, it started in their city, in Jerusalem. Then it went to the state, <laughs> Judea. And then it went to outcast, <laughs> foreigners, Samaritans. And then all over the world, the utmost part of the earth. You understand? God has given us such a great opportunity to do these things. Let's not miss our, our visitation to where God said like to Isaiah, who can I send? You're empowered. Will you go? Will you represent me with a true representation, true representation of the resurrection life that you present to an individual? You live it. You experience it. And then... You can convince others it's real. But if you haven't experienced it, you don't even know if it's real. You with me? This is the day of resurrection and life. And I don't mean a day. I mean the time that we're to be about the Father's business. Amen? That's the message. I think you got the point. Or I hope so. Anyway. Okay. Father, I thank you that you bless us indeed. You enlarge our territory. Your hand's with us to keep us from evil so that we do not cause pain. And I thank you for blessing us and keeping us and for making your face to shine upon us and being gracious unto us. You lift up your countenance upon us and you give us peace. So, Lord, we're glad to invite you to rise up, to let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. Amen. Amen. Amen.